Hello, this is video lecture number 69, uh, Power Among Powers. Uh, today we have three subsections, the open door in Asia, the United States in the Caribbean, and Wilson in Mexico. So American foreign policy focused on two areas, uh, the Caribbean and the Pacific. Uh, in Asia, the United States spent two years putting down the insurrection of Philippines nationalists. Uh, these military operations cost some 4,300 American lives and as many as 300,000 Filipino lives. Once pacified, the islands were supposed to serve as a springboard for American business interests in China. Uh, however, China proved to be a difficult market to enter. Europeans were long established there, and in 1900, the Chinese attempted to end all foreign domination. Although the Boxer Rebellion failed, it allowed Secretary of State John Hay to insist that all the powers recognize the independence of China, along with the legitimacy of American interests there. Beginning in the 1890s, European nations exhibited what the United States feared was an imperial interest in the Caribbean. Uh, for example, in 1895, Great Britain pressed for a uh, border claim uh, for British Guyana against Venezuela. Uh, Grover Cleveland responded by invoking the Monroe Doctrine. Seven years after the Venezuela crisis, Venezuela defaulted on some loans. Great Britain, Germany, and Italy sent a naval force that fired on Venezuelan military installations. This time, Theodore Roosevelt mounted a diplomatic counteroffensive with the so-called Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. Roosevelt warned that government incompetence by Caribbean nations would force the United States, however reluctantly, in flagrant cases of wrongdoing or impotence uh, to the exercise of an international police power. Although Europe heeded the warning, uh, the U.S. policymakers found that it was easier to build the Panama Canal than to avoid invoking the Roosevelt Corollary. Indeed, by 1917, American troops had landed at various times in Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Nicaragua, and Mexico. However, these demonstrations of force failed to deter Europe from challenging U.S. hegemony in this part of the world. So let's have a closer look then at a power among powers, starting with our first section, the open door in Asia. American policymakers and business leaders had a burning interest in East Asian markets, uh, but they were entering a crowded field. In the late 1890s, following Japan's victory in the Sino-Japanese War of 1894-95, Japan, Russia, Germany, France, and Britain divided coastal China into spheres of influence. Fearful of being shut out, U.S. Secretary of State John Hay in 1899 sent these powers a note claiming the right of equal trade access, uh, an open door for all nations seeking to do business in China. When a secret society of Chinese nationalists, known outside China as boxers, uh, rebelled against foreign occupation in 1900, the United States sent 5,000 troops to join a multinational campaign to break the boxers' siege of European government offices in Beijing. In these years, Europe and the United States were startled by an unexpected development. Japan was emerging as East Asia's dominant power. A decade after its victory over China in 1895, Japan responded to Russian rivalry for control of both the Korean Peninsula and Manchuria uh, in northern China by attacking the Tsar's fleet at Russia's least Chinese port. In a series of brilliant victories, the Japanese smashed the Russian forces. Roosevelt himself mediated a settlement in 1905. Contemptuous of other Asians, uh, Roosevelt respected the Japanese, uh, whom he called a wonderful and civilized people. Um, more importantly, he saw Japan's rising military might. In 1908, the United States and Japan signed the Root Takahira Agreement, confirming principles of free oceanic commerce and recognizing Japan's authority over Manchuria. Now, William Howard Taft entered the White House in 1909, uh, convinced 
that the United States had been shortchanged in Asia. Uh, he pressed for a larger role for American investors, especially in Chinese railroad construction. Eager to promote U.S. business interests abroad, he hoped that infusions of American capital would offset Japanese power. When the Chinese Revolution of 1911 toppled the Manchu dynasty, Taft supported the victorious nationalists uh, who wanted to modernize their country and they also wanted to liberate it from Japanese domination. The U.S. had entangled itself in China and entered a long-term rivalry with Japan for power in the Pacific, uh, a competition that would culminate 30 years later in World War II. So let's move on to the next section, the United States and the Caribbean. Closer to home, uh, European powers conceded Roosevelt's argument that the United States had a paramount interest in the Caribbean. In 1900, the United States consulted with Britain on the building of a canal across Central America. In the Hay uh, Ponsafote Treaty of 1901, Britain recognized the United States' right uh, their sole right to build and fortify a Central American canal. Now, in facing rivals, Roosevelt famously argued that the United States should speak softly and carry a big stick. By big stick, he meant most of all naval power and rapid access to two oceans required a canal. Freed by Britain's surrender of canal rights, Roosevelt persuaded Congress to authorize $10 million plus future payments of $250,000 per year to purchase from Colombia a six-mile strip of land across Panama, which was a Colombian province. Furious when Colombia rejected this proposal, Roosevelt contemplated outright seizure of Panama, uh, but settled on a more roundabout solution. Uh, Panamanians, long separated from Colombia by miles of remote jungle, uh, chafed under Colombian rule. The United States then lent covert assistance to an independence movement, which triggered a bloodless revolution. On November 6, 1903, the United States recognized the new nation of Panama. Uh, two weeks later, it obtained a perpetually renewable lease on a canal zone. Roosevelt never regretted the venture, uh, though in 1922, the United States paid Colombia $25 million as kind of a conscience money. Roosevelt was already working in other ways also to strengthen U.S. control of the Caribbean. As a condition for its withdrawal from the island in 1902, uh, the United States forced Cuba to accept a proviso in its constitution called the Platt Amendment, uh, which blocked Cuba from making a treaty with any country except the United States and gave the United States the right to intervene in Cuban affairs if it saw fit. Cuba also granted the United States a lease on Guantanamo, which is still in effect, where the U.S. Navy built a large base. Claiming that instability invited European intervention, Roosevelt announced in 1904 that the United States would police all parts of the Caribbean. This so-called Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine actually turned that doctrine upside down. Uh, instead of guaranteeing that the United States would protect its Latin American neighbors from European powers and help preserve their independence, uh, it asserted the United States' unrestricted right to regulate Caribbean affairs. The Roosevelt Corollary was not a treaty. Uh, it was a unilateral declaration uh, sanctioned only by America's military and economic might. Citing the Corollary, the United States intervened regularly in uh, Caribbean states over the next three decades. Okay, here's our last section, Wilson and Mexico. Since the 1870s, Mexican dictator uh, Porfirio Diaz had created a friendly climate for American investors who purchased railroads, plantations, mines, and much coveted oil fields. By the early 1900s, however, he feared the extraordinary power of these economic interests uh, and began to nationalize or reclaim these key resources. Powerful American investors who faced the loss of their Mexican holdings began to back uh, Francisco Madero, uh, an advocate of constitutional government who was friendlier to U.S. interests. In 1911, 
Madero forced Diaz to resign and proclaimed himself president, but his position was weak. In February 1913, Madero was deposed and murdered by a leading general, Victoriano Huerta. The Wilson administration became increasingly fearful that the revolution there threatened U.S. interests. Over, over the strong protests of Venustiano Carranza, uh, the Mexican leader whom Wilson most favored, the United States threw its own forces into the emerging Mexican Revolution. On the pretext of a minor insult to the U.S. Navy, uh, Wilson ordered U.S. occupation of the port of Veracruz on April 21st, 1914, at the cost of 19 American and 126 Mexican lives. The Huerta regime crumbled. Uh, Carranza's forces, after nearly engaging the Americans themselves, entered Mexico City in triumph in August 1914. But Wilson's heavy-handed military interference caused lasting mistrust. Carranza's victory did not subdue all revolutionary activity. In 1916, General Pancho Villa stirred up trouble on the U.S.-Mexico border, killing 16 American civilians and raiding the town of Columbus, New Mexico. Wilson sent 11,000 troops under General John J. Pershing across the border after Pancho Villa. Uh, soon, Pershing's force resembled an army of occupation. Mexican public opinion demanded withdrawal, uh, and armed clashes broke out between U.S. and Mexican troops. At the brink of war, both governments backed off, and U.S. forces withdrew. The following year, Carranza's government finally received official recognition from Washington. But U.S. policymakers had shown their intention to police not only the Caribbean uh, but, uh, and Central America, but also Mexico, whenever they deemed it necessary. All right, so that's it for today, video lecture number 69. So go ahead and answer your review questions at the bottom of the screen and continue on with your work.